We've been in this Jesus is series, and when we preached on Easter, talked about Easter and what the resurrection meant, it meant that if Jesus really did resurrect from the grave, which he did, what the Bible has to say about Jesus is true. And so we talked about the first sermon, how Jesus was accessible. He was willing and ready to minister to people and love people uh, and meet them and their needs and where they're at. Last week, we talked about how Jesus is merciful. And that was in Luke chapter 4. We met this woman who had had a bleeding problem for 12 years. And Jesus loved on her and healed her and her body. And she should have been taken according to the law. At least the religious leaders would have punished her. But Jesus didn't give her what she deserved. By the law standards. And that's what mercy means. Not getting something that you deserve. And we talked about how we are sinners. And we deserve God's wrath and his punishment. Because God is a just God. But God saves us by his mercy. In not giving us the punishment that we deserve. Today we're going to be talking about how Jesus is graceful. Getting grace from God is some incredible experience that we all have, and it ranges from the good things that we experience in this life. James says every good and perfect gift is from God above. But when we talk about how Jesus is graceful and getting the grace of God, specifically we're dealing with the subject of salvation. Salvation is getting something that you don't deserve. So if mercy is not getting what you do deserve, grace is getting something that you don't deserve. It's an unmerited gift. It's unmerited favor. It's like breaking the law and the cop comes to the scene. And not only does he not arrest you or punish you, but he also gives you a $15 gift certificate to Chick-fil-A. And you're like, man, this is great. (laughs) How much better can it get? But with God, obviously, it's so much greater because not only does God not punish us, But then he gives us the gift of eternal life. And so we have this guy named Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, the embodiment of who God is in the flesh, and Jesus is graceful. This week during my study and reading and preparation time, I read a story uh, in a book by a guy named Philip Yancey, and he begins this story. Um, Philip was a, a journalist. He's won numerous awards. He is an editor at a Christian magazine. And he was approached by a woman who was a prostitute. And this woman was broken, she was suffering, she was crying, she was weak, and she was in desperate need of help. And she had lived a very terrible life. She had made a lot of really bad mistakes, worse than you could probably even imagine. And so Philip had this conversation with her, and she had mentioned some things that were really in violation, not only of ethics, but of the law. And so by law, he's required to report these things to the law. And he has this tension. Not only is he angry with her for the bad things that she's done, but he also wants to give her compassion and grace. So he's got to mandatorily report things, while at the same time trying to help this woman and heal her and give her something that, frankly, because of her choices, she doesn't deserve. And so he says, I was at a loss for words. I mean, we're talking about a very intelligent, experienced person. And he says, well, have you thought about going to your local church? And she laughed at him. And she said, church, I already feel bad enough about myself. If I wanted to feel worse, I'd go to church. I need somebody to help me. Well, unfortunately, sometimes religious people, maybe Christians, Hindus, Muslims, people who claim to be religious and to do good can be some of the most graceless individuals that we come to meet. And unfortunately, if you see things on TV or you read Facebook posts, sometimes Christians can develop this reputation for taking people according to the law without exercising the grace and the goodness of God. And this morning we find a similar situation A story about a woman who has developed a certain reputation for herself and she throws herself down at the feet of Jesus. This man who she's heard wonderful things about that is unlike any other man. No one spoke like this man spoke. And so we're in Luke chapter 7 to talk about this story, this woman who's in desperate need of God's grace. And the simple fact of the matter is, is she doesn't deserve God's grace. And that's what's powerful about grace is it is something that you do not deserve. And none of us deserve God's grace. And so a little bit of background about Luke chapter 7. This is the only record that we find about this unnamed woman in the Gospels. There are other similar stories to this, but this is a unique separate story. And so we shouldn't confuse this with Mary Magdalene in John chapter 12, where she approaches Jesus as a prostitute, and she falls at his feet, and she anoints his feet with this very expensive perfume. And we've got this guy named Jesus, right, who is saving people, healing people, 
shepherding people. He's traveling all around Jerusalem and Judea and the countryside, and he's developing a certain reputation as a guy who not only preaches in the synagogue, who doesn't make any mistakes, but out of all things, he eats with sinners. The religious people were sitting around and condemning Jesus, saying, what kind of guy like that? He's supposed to be a teacher, and yet he's hanging out with these people that are sinners. He should be spending time with us and looking at them in condemnation. And Jesus, over and over again, the gospel tells this story about how ignorant sinners understand and are wiser than the religious elitists. And that's what this story begins to develop. Literarily, Luke is developing this thought that Jesus is not only a good person, Jesus is a perfect prophet, and he is God in the flesh. And that's the intention of Luke here. And we're going to pick up in verse 36. We find this powerful story of grace contrasted with a stern rebuke of judgmentalism and narrow-mindedness. And so if you'll read along with me here in Luke chapter 7, verse 36, here's what it says. It says, Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house, and he sat down to eat. This is the first of three occurrences where Jesus was invited by the religious elite in the community. And so it shows us that Jesus would not only meet and eat with sinners, but he also ate with people that were considered to be holy and religious. Jesus isn't a respecter of persons. He's going to give everybody a fair shot. And he would come to this banquet and it would have a U-shaped table. And we're familiar uh, with a, a long table and Jesus sitting with his disciples, right? Everyone's on his right or on his left and they just got this really long table. Well, the only reason why that picture was ever painted was to get everybody in the picture. And that's not how they ate in biblical times. They would have a U-shaped table, and they would have a seat of honor. Um, they would have a seat where specific guests would sit, and then they would sit on their elbow, specifically their left elbow. They would recline at the table. They would eat with their right hand, and their feet would be extended out away from the table. And so if you could picture this U-shape where the servant would come up, and they would give people drink and food. And here is Jesus, invited to a dinner by a Pharisee, a religious leader, and he's reclining at this dinner in the seat of honor. He is a teacher. It was a very common practice for people who were the elite in the community to host specific dinners for recognition and social status, and you better believe if a guy like Jesus is in town, you're going to treat him to a meal. And so that's exactly what we find here. Another important thing to understand about this story is that hospitality was something that was very, very important in the ancient Near East culture. And so they would have certain special greetings, uh, they would do certain things, and so being a hospitable person was everything in this culture. And we're going to find out this guy named Simon the Pharisee doesn't do some of the very basic things that a hospitable person would do in this time. Let's continue to read a story in verse 37. Look what it says. It says, and behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus had sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. We see that this, this lady, she's a sinner in the city. She's developed a reputation. Everybody knows who this woman is, okay? And so even though we don't know her name, even though there's not a specific sin that is mentioned here, almost every scholar that you will read about identifies this woman as a prostitute. She is somebody that has sold her body and the things that she would do for money. That's how she earns her income. And she has developed a nasty reputation in the community. She is not just a sinner. She is the sinner in the city. And this is what's interesting, that sometimes when they would throw these elavagant feasts and these banquets and dinners, they would allow the poor to come through and gather up the scraps and the leftovers from the table. And so here you have this woman taking advantage of the social customs of that day, coming in, to find this man named Jesus. And Jesus is eating with the most religious people in the community. Think about the kind of courage that that would take. Think about how humiliating it would be knowing you're going to be judged, knowing you're going to be ostracized, knowing you're unwanted, unloved. They don't even want to touch you, let alone uh, eat with you. And you come in and you want to humble yourself at the feet of Jesus. Jesus. 
the rabbis had this certain law, um, which was an unspoken law. But basically, if you were a prostitute, you were declared unclean. Nobody wanted to be around you. That's the kind of reputation that this woman had. In fact, the teachers of the law, like this Pharisee, had this unspoken rule that they weren't allowed to even stand within five to seven feet of an individual like this. I mean, think about that. If I was somebody like that, I would just run after them. You know what I mean? <laughs> just kind of mess with them. But, uh, but that, I actually, I, I probably wouldn't because you'd get stoned or beat. So that would be a bad thing. But here's this woman, totally humiliated, an untouchable, so to speak, and she enters the enemy territory. And she's got this overwhelming conviction. And, and you can understand why she's unwanted, okay? For a few reasons. First of all, prostitution was an abomination under the old law. People who prostitute themselves, whether for money, acceptance, relationship, to give yourself over to sexual acts to other people for some type of gain is unbiblical. It's an abomination, Israel was warned over and over again about the seduction of a prostitute. Proverbs says, don't even go near her door. This idea of what it's to be a wise person, don't even go near people who are sexually promiscuous. That's what a wise man would do, is what Solomon said. And I think that's probably pretty good information for us today, right? If you struggle with sexual temptation, don't even go down that route. Don't even scratch the surface. Stay away from the movies, the songs, the TV shows. Get rid of it all. Don't even go near. Before the law On a few specific instances, a prostitute was burned because she was a prostitute. In fact, if you were a daughter of a Levite, of a rabbi, of a teacher under the old law, and you prostituted yourself, he was to have to burn you himself. I mean, that's, that's a pretty severe punishment, if you ask me, right? And so that was more of a prescriptive thing. In other words, they wanted the punishment to be so very severe that people wouldn't even think about prostitution. And so here's this woman. On the backdrop of this story, Israel had been symbolized, uh, symbolized time and time again as a prostitute who left God and had got the punishment and the anger of God. But yet we see something woven through the Old Testament story of prostitution, and it has to do with this guy named Hosea. It's a book. And God told Hosea to go marry a prostitute. And he said, I want you to show Israel my love for them by marrying an untouchable, by being together with somebody who doesn't deserve to be loved. And so while we have all this strong punishment for prostitution, at the same time, we've got this picture and this glimpse of who God is, that he is willing to pursue those who have done some of the worst, most terrible things. And here's this woman This prostitute, this unnamed person who's heard about this guy called Emmanuel, God with us, and she's wondering, is there enough grace for me? Is this the Hosea in the Old Testament that I could find somebody that would love me and redeem me and pursue me? On a normal occasion, this prostitute would have been rejected and avoided, but yet, what do we see in the text? This woman learned that Jesus was there. Maybe she heard about this guy who heals lepers, who casts out demons, who heals the deaf and the blind. Maybe she heard about this Jesus who preached one of the most incredible sermons on the mount, one of the most incredible pieces of literature that we have of all time. And she hears about how merciful and how graceful and how incredible this guy, God in the flesh, really is. Maybe she heard about this guy who calms the storm and eats with sinners, somebody who stands up to the hypocrisy, to the Pharisees, to the people who judge according to the law while they're sinning behind closed doors. Perhaps she's heard about this guy named Jesus who welcomed himself into the house of a guy named Levi who was also identified as a sinner because he was a tax collector and he stole from people. But yet Jesus pursues him and eats with him. Maybe she's heard about how Jesus said this, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So you can imagine this woman who has lived a terrible life, who is willing to risk it all. She enters this place where she knows she's unwanted and hated, doesn't even want to be touched or looked at. But yet she's seeking after this man named Jesus. And look what she brings. 
She brings a jar of one of the most expensive perfumes that was known at that time. It came in this beautiful, it was almost like um, stone is what it was, and it looked like a rainbow, and it was this little box that they would put their perfume in. And scholars do guesstimate that it was a year to a year and a half worth of salary. Think about that for a minute. Think about your job, how much you make before taxes. 50, 60, 30, 40, 100, whatever your yearly salary is, she brings it to the feet of Jesus to put it on his dirty, mud-stained, and frankly, manure-stained feet. I mean, they had to walk through some of the most disgusting stuff, and they wore sandals that had open toes to it, right? Open feet. And so their feet would be totally disgusting. I mean, yuck. We don't even like feet with socks. You know what I'm saying? Like, there were no socks, no closed toes shoes. It was just yuck. And so you'd come to eat, and one of the typical things that a person would do is they would have a servant wash your feet. And so here is Jesus reclining at the table, a woman in desperate need of grace, and there she stands behind Jesus, and the Bible says she is weeping greatly. The Greek word here is used for a torrential downpour. Think about that. Have you ever cried that hard? I mean, the tears are flowing so much that she is able to actually wash Jesus' feet. That's, that's a lot of tears. That's a lot of water. But yet, she is so humbled and she is so grateful because she's experienced something. And she's not just washing his feet with her tears, but she actually unties her hair. A social custom in that day, if you let your hair down, that was the equivalent of taking your shirt off. That's, that's what kind of social thing that they had going on there, right? It was a culture law, so to speak. And so she lets her hair down completely in humiliation, and she begins to scrub his dirty feet with her hair. I mean, that is just unthinkable. I wouldn't even want to scrub it with a brush and gloves, let alone my own hair. But that's what this woman is doing. She is at the feet of Jesus, desperate for grace. And then, as if that's not enough, she takes the most expensive thing that she owns. Everything. I mean, this wouldn't just be salary that she worked for. This is something that was likely to have been handed down from her parents. This had a lot of emotional attachment to it. So think about not just your salary, but the most precious thing that you own. Your house, your boat, your souped up car, your expensive wardrobe your children, your most precious thing. And in the blink of an eye, without hesitation, you are overcome with generosity. And she pours this perfume on the feet of Jesus. And she's weeping and she's crying. Perhaps she's heard Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. It says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You see, she's heard about this guy named Jesus who is righteous and does things according to the law, while at the same time is gracious and merciful and good. In fact, often Jesus, instead of doing the right thing by the law, would often do the good thing. Instead of letting a man's donkey die because it was the Sabbath day, and this donkey's in the pit and he's going to lose everything, Jesus says, for crying out loud, go help the man. Get the donkey out of the pit. It's like driving to church and wanting to make it to church on time, but yet you see somebody on the, lo- on, on the side of the road who's just been hit in a car accident. For crying out loud, don't make it to church on time. Help the person, right? Jesus says the Sabbath was made for, for man. Man wasn't made for the Sabbath. And so he's not going to take this woman according to the law. He's going to do what is good for this woman, what is best for this woman, in desperate need of grace. Picking up in verse 39, look at what happens It says, now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, notice he spoke to himself. In other words, you've talked to yourself, right? I look in the mirror and I'm like, man, what a mess. (laughs) But I don't say it out loud because I don't want Angel to think that, right? But we all say things to ourselves. Maybe you've been sitting here in the auditorium and you're saying, wow, Rick is a really good looking guy, right? Probably not, but hopefully my wife is saying that. Or maybe you're thinking, wow, Rick talks really fast or is really loud. I know, trust me. Angel tells me every week. No, I'm just kidding. She doesn't. She's really gracious to me. She's like, she tells me I'm awesome. I'm a good preacher. And I'm like, you know, lying is a sin, okay? It's in the Bible. (laughs) But anyways, anyway, so so here's this guy talking to himself. And notice what he says to himself. Verse 39. This man, if he were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is to touch him. For she is a sinner. 
You see, Jesus is an out-of-towner. He's not familiar with this place. But if he is a prophet, he's got certain abilities that the normal person wouldn't have. And if anybody knows this woman is a sinner, even though Simon the Pharisee was an insider and he knew her reputation, if Jesus was a prophet, he certainly would know that this woman is this type of sinner and he would not allow her to touch him. And so he's telling himself this, this woman who has lived a sinful life. And, you know, these are the, this, he's the type of person that makes a passive-aggressive comment, right? Just sits there and kind of like whispers, judges, curses, ostracized in his own mind. We know those kind of people, right? Maybe even some of those people are in here. Maybe you know some people at your office or in your family. I mean, all they do is just cut people down behind closed doors. But the moment you confront them to their face... What's their usual response? Well, that's what we're going to find. Look at what happens here. Jesus answered to him, Simon. That's how I like to maybe think that he says it. Right? Simon's sitting there judging this woman, whispering about her. Sinner. Jesus. He's not a prophet. He can't be the son of God, this guy claiming this. He's letting this sinner touch him after all. And so he says, Simon, I've got something to say to you. And look at Simon's response. What a gutless coward, right? Too scared to stand up to Jesus. He calls him rabbi, teacher, teacher. Yeah, say it. In other words, he doesn't let Jesus know how he truly feels. But yet, Jesus is far much more than he thought was possible. Look at verse 40, 41. He gives him this parable. There was a certain creditor who had two debts. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which one of them will love more? So Jesus here is going to give the most elementary, basic parable to show Simon how much of a hypocrite he is and how far he has misunderstood the heart and the image of God. And so he says, Simon, which one is going to love more? What's the obvious answer, Simon responds? He says, Simon answered and said, I suppose, just too arrogant, too arrogant to even admit that he's wrong. I mean, just a Pharisee point, matter of fact. Well, I suppose it's the woman, the one who was forgiven more. And Jesus said to him, you have rightly judged. You got it right, Simon. The one who loves much is the one who has been forgiven much. And so Jesus, in this moment, rebukes Simon as a Pharisee with a basic parable, bypassing his flattery, which shows that Jesus is authentic. And he goes straight to the heart of the matter that the, wo- the reason why this woman is at my feet is because she has been forgiven and generosity just overcomes her heart. And it flows out from her in the expression of weeping and repentance and gra- a gracious gift, a most precious gift. And look at what Jesus does here in verse 44. He's going to apply this parable. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, you see this woman? Of course he saw this woman. She entered his house. Of course he saw this woman. Do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. A basic bare minimum courtesy. It would be like someone coming into your house and you say, hey, can I get you something to drink? Right? A refreshment. He says, you didn't even, you didn't even have anybody wash my feet. The basic common courtesy. But look at what he says about the woman. He says, You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss. A normal greeting, right? I'm kind of glad that we don't have this kind of greeting here today. If you go over to the UK, they kiss each other. I'm like, don't kiss me, man. (laughs) I'm a dude. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) I'm not going to get kissed. That's weird. I want your lips on my face. But hey, that was normal for them. No big deal. The equivalent would be like this, right? I have a special chair in my house and at my dinner table. Maybe all of you guys have that same special chair. But when somebody's in my house, hey, would you like to have a seat, right? You give them your special chair. Why? It's the common courtesy thing to do. That's what nice people do. But yet, he didn't even do that. He didn't give him the basic greeting. But yet, Jesus was his honored guest as a teacher, right? And look what he goes on to say here. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. I mean, she is just overwhelmed with gratitude. And she's kissing this guy's feet unwashed. He says, you did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with a fragrant oil. 
What they would do for their honored guests, and Jesus is probably sitting in the seat of honor, remember that U-shaped table, is that they would come up and they would anoint your head with oil because your hair could develop a smell, um, it would often get dry, and so this was something that they would do for somebody that was special. Because oil was a very great luxury, so to speak, right? It just wasn't something that you could just come by and go pick up at the supermarket. It cost a lot of money. And yet here's this woman taking everything that she has and putting it on Jesus' feet. In other words, he's saying, Simon, you are an inconsiderate little brat who thinks that you are guilty of nothing. And you know how I know that? I know that because you don't love much. But yet this woman does. And here she is, a sinner, repentant, aware of what she's done. And she comes unto me, but you are so proud and arrogant that you're not even willing to do the basic, common, decent thing. That's what this Pharisee was like. So Jesus gives him this parable. He illustrates his point. And hopefully, Simon the Pharisee would have been struck to the heart in that moment. I doubt it. Because sometimes people's heart are so hard that even if you hit them with a two-by-four, it breaks the two-by-four, and they walk away saying, no big deal, right? That's how some people are. I mean, they are just so mean-spirited and ignorant. And that's how this guy is. And look at what Jesus says to the woman in verse 48. He said, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Forgiven is in the perfect tense. It means a past occurrence, a past accomplished fact that is carried into the future. It means that this woman has loved and has given much because Jesus has given her forgiveness. Now, we don't know what happened before this story. We don't know if Jesus had a conversation with her or exactly what took place. All we know are the results, the effect of a forgiven heart. And that's exactly what this woman displays. And she acts out in faith because her sins are forgiven. And you see, Simon didn't think that he needed the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, he did not turn to Christ in faith. Look at what the other guests had to say in verse 49. The other guests began to say amongst themselves, who is this that can forgive sins? And yet Jesus says to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. You are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. You are standing right before God. Now go in peace. This word peace is shalom, right? It means just not just like, oh, everything's okay, but it means with the peace of God, with the relationship and the goodness and the mercy of God, with the right standing before God. Here Jesus is forgiving a woman. Not only is he prophet, but he is Lord, he is Savior. He is God and the flesh. And that's what Luke's point is here. And I'd like to reflect on a few things as we conclude this story. First of all, Luke affirms, affirms, as I said, that Jesus is superior to prophets because he divinely is able to understand and read this Pharisee's thoughts. He responds to what he was thinking. He got called out, in other words. The gift of discernment Jesus certainly had. That would be kind of scary if somebody had the gift of discernment today. Don't you agree? If somebody knew what you were thinking, I'd be like, I am in big trouble. (laughs) No, I'm serious. I am in big trouble because there are some jacked up things that go through this head. No doubt about it. There are some times where I identify with a Pharisee like Simon because sometimes I can be a self-righteous little brat. And it's the truth. And I think if we were all honest with ourselves, we all have points in time in our life where we are so self-righteous and lack so much compassion and grace. And this is Simon. But yet, Jesus understands our thoughts. I mean, it is just as good as if he was standing here with us. Maybe your mind has wondered this sermon. Maybe you're thinking, man, when's Rick going to wrap it up? And you're thinking about everything else you have to do. Well, Jesus knows your thoughts. He knows exactly what's going through your mind. But yet he extends grace and forgiveness to us. You see, God accepts this sinner, this woman, on the basis of her acceptance of Jesus' forgiveness. There's a condition there. God is not going to force his forgiveness on you. It is something that you must accept. God has an open hand, a free gift, an unmerited gift of grace of salvation. You have to be willing to accept it the way that he asks. In a commentary I read this week, one of the commentators said this, All who understand the depth of their own sin and the cost of redemption will respond in a grateful and costly act of devotion, not only to Jesus, but in imitation of Jesus. And so if the grace of God has impacted your heart and you've been convicted and you recognize the amount of debt that Jesus has forgiven you of, you'll respond accordingly. 
you'll accept it. You'll welcome it. You'll let it into your heart and into your mind. Second of all, look at what Jesus said here. One of the most powerful passages of Scripture in all of the Bible. He says this, Whoever loves much has been forgiven of much. That was the parable. The reason why this woman loves much is because she's been forgiven of much. And I don't even think Jesus wanted Simon the Pharisee to place himself in the person who's been forgiven just a little bit, right? Because obviously Simon is showing no response to Jesus, no humility, no gratefulness. After all, he's not even willing to do the basic common courtesy things. All Jesus is doing is illustrating a point. The reason why this woman is so graceful and wonderful to me and is so generous is because she realizes the debt that she's been forgiven. Another quote I read this week was this. You can sacrifice and not love, but you cannot love and not sacrifice. And so the key mark of a person who recognizes the grace and goodness of God is generosity. Not only of what you have, but of who you are. Notice this woman is not only generous with what she has, her most prized possession, but even who she is. Sacrifices her time, her reputation, and she goes and she washes Jesus' feet with her own tears and her own hair. I want to encourage you this morning. Let God's forgiveness into your heart to such a powerful degree that you are generous. That you are generous with not only who you are, but what you have. Paul told Timothy this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. They should put their trust in God, who richly gives to us all who need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. Be generous. Don't let Satan trick your heart into thinking that if I hold and I hoard, I will be happier. It shows two things. Number one, a lack of penetration of the gospel. There's a faith issue. There's a self-recognition issue. But number two, you've been tricked into the lie of materialism. The more I have, the happier that I'll be. You know, in the church, sometimes people get upset. They see things go on in the church, leadership decisions that, that happen, and so they do what's called hostage giving. In other words, they stop giving until things start going their way. Isn't that a heart issue? Doesn't that show us that there's a heart issue going on here, that you think that you are in control of your finances and that what you have belongs to you and that the church is somehow in debt to you or God is somehow in debt to you. God is worth everything, everything that we have, just like this woman. And so being generous shows where our priorities are, but it also shows us that God has really penetrated our heart. I am willing to serve and give and do whatever it takes because God has forgiven me and it is a debt that I cannot pay back. That's the kind of heart that this woman has. And so I want to encourage you this morning to be generous. Second of all, Jesus says, whoever has been forgiven little loves little. That's another perspective. I like what Psalms 139 verses 23 and 24 have to say. The psalmist wrote this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. And so because God has forgiven us much, we have got to maintain the right perspective on our past, our present, and our future. Not only be generous, but always remember, look, we are broken people saved by the grace of God. And the moment anybody in this church or in this world gets on a high horse and starts separating the sinners from the righteous, there's a big issue. There are only two categories. They get it right. The people who sin and the people who don't sin. And I've got bad news for everybody in this room. We are all in this category, right? We are all sinners in need of God's grace, and the only person in this category is Jesus. He was perfect. And so we can't give these religious labels about who's good and who's not and who's better and who's best, and that because I do all of these good things and I'm not as bad as that person over there, I'm righteous and they're a sinner, and I deserve God's grace, and they don't. So we cannot lose perspective on who we are. We have been given a gift 
that we do not deserve. And God offers that gift to everyone. And so I want to encourage you to be generous and have perspective on your past, present, and future. And then finally is this. Your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. Not your money. Not your humble service. Not washing my feet with your hair or kissing my feet or your expensive perfume. But it is your trust that Jesus is who he says he is and I follow him. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And so we need to hold on to the promise and the purpose of salvation, a faith-based relationship with Jesus. It is about having a relationship with him. And we may be blessed to hear the same words that this woman heard. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. And so I hope that you can take that with you this morning. But if you don't take that with you this morning, I want to encourage you to read the gospel to figure out who this Jesus guy is. He is accessible to you. He is merciful to you. He is gracious to you. And over the next few weeks, we're going to get to find out a little bit more about this guy named Jesus. One of my favorite passages of scripture is in Colossians chapter 2, where it talks about how we have been buried with Christ through baptism, and it's where we receive the circumcision of our heart. That's chapter 2, verse 12. And then he goes on to give this very impressive picture of what it's like to be the woman that we find in this story. He says, Your debts and your transgressions have been nailed to the cross and canceled out. Isn't that an awesome picture? Nailed to the cross and canceled out. If you have done some terrible things like prostitution and sexual immorality, or maybe you've always lived a good life, never really stole, or maybe only said a few lies, the debt is still equal because you're still in the sinner's category. Regardless of what you've done, there is grace available for you. God is willing to forgive you. The only thing that you have to do is accept it. The Bible says if you're willing to place your trust in Jesus, if you're willing to confess him as Lord and turn away from your sin, just like this woman in the story. And it says, if you're willing to be baptized in Jesus' name, when God saves you, as you die to your old self and resurrect to the new, God says, I am willing to give you your forgiveness and your mercy and your salvation. All you have to do is...